Uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to talk here about uh, PICO. PICO is a concept for a probe scale, a next decade space mission. A probe scale in the NASA uh, language is in the cost window between uh, 400 million and a thousand, so a billion dollar. The concept development was supported by NASA over the last 18 months or so. We're just about to uh, produce a report from, uh, from the concept. And um, the product from this entire study is the report that we submit to NASA, and NASA will submit to the decadal panel in about six, seven months. Um, this is one of eight such studies that NASA has funded, not only, uh, so all, over all areas in astrophysics, and all of those will be submitted to the decadal panel for periodization. Um, uh, the study has been open uh, for the entire community to contribute to, and in fact, uh, there are about um, uh, maybe 60 or 70 people, uh, about 20 in the executive committee, three in the steering committee, uh, about 30 or 40 authors, and, and some many more endorsers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the report is in the final stages. Uh, it can be found here. And uh, if you wish to endorse, you can endorse in this page. All right. What is PICO? PICO is a sub-millimeter, millimeter survey, a polarimetric survey of the entire sky. So this is already the outcome from, from the study, from our study. So this is, we didn't start like this, we ended up like that. And how we got there, I'll describe. It has 21 bands between 20 and 800 gigahertz. It's based on a 1.4 meter aperture telescope. The resolution is one arc minute at 800 gigahertz and about 40 arc minutes at 20 gigahertz. It uses 13,000 transition head sensors uh, with multiplex readouts. It's a five year survey from L2. Um, the requirement is to reach 0.87 or 0.9 micro Kevin arc minute over the entire sky. Uh, this is equivalent to 3,300 Planck missions. We think we will do better. Um, and we'll reach about 0.6, which is a micro which is uh, uh, 6,700 Planck missions over the sky. What I'll do in the next uh, few slides, I will describe the um, science objectives. There are seven science objectives that drove the mission design and led to these conclusions or to this particular design. Uh, there's much broader science, so I'll mention also the breadth of the science, and I hope there's two or three minutes in the end to show you the more technical details. Most of the talk is detailed on the science deliverables. Science objective number one is inflation. Uh, classes of models that naturally explain an S and have a scale of uh, Planck mass in the potential or larger have a tensor to scalar ratio of 5 times 10 to the, 10 to, 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So this is shown here on the uh, usual plot, R versus NS, uh, the Planck constraints, uh, 1 sigma, 2 sigma, their number of ranges, and these lines are various um, uh, Planck, uh, Planck scales. This is 2 Planck scale, 10, uh, 10 Planck masses, sorry. So the, the goal for PICO is to reach a 5 times 10 to the minus 4 at 5 sigma. If you want to think about it differently, it's uh, sigma r of 1, 10, 10 to the minus 4. Here is the uh, standard plot with uh, CL versus L. Uh, this is 1, 10, 10 to the minus 4, 1, 10, 10 to the minus 3. The E modes, the lensing modes with some current detections. Uh, this is uh, the gray error bars of the projected uh, uh, detections on E modes and the lensing. And after cleaning the lensing and hopefully removing foregrounds, which I'll talk about momentarily, this is 5 times 10 to the minus 4 with the arrow bars. Up here uh, is the foregrounds, uh, or I should say is the total signal at 155 gigahertz dominated by foregrounds. This is at 75 gigahertz dominated by foregrounds with a little bit of a bump from the lensing here. 
So the first thing one should ask is, what do we do with the foregrounds? Can we reach that goal? Um, when, you, when we do a Fisher forecast that includes correlated foregrounds, foreground separation, 40% of the sky, and delensing, it gives, uh, with the Pico noise, of course, it gives a sigma r of 2 times 10 to the minus 5. We do not quote 2 times 10 to the minus 5. We think the Fisher forecast is optimistic. What I'm showing here uh, is one of a set of simulations. This is using a PySM model uh, of foregrounds. It uses r equals 0, so what you see here is just the lensing. 50% of sky. Uh, it's, I should say, it's 50% it's, uh, of the lensing amplitude because we forecast 85% of the lensing removal. Of course, the Pico noise and gene former uh, generalized needlet ILC, foreground removal, with the 21 bands. What you see here is, is the lensing signal, uh, uh, the theory in dash. The red are the simulations. You can see the simulation reproduces the signal very well with about a factor of two excess coming from the residual foreground that's shown here in yellow. Um, for the 5 times 10 to the minus 4 signal, the residual is below the signal, about a factor of 10 here, um, at the low end, and about a factor of 4. Um, so there is a hope, and there are some indications that with the 21 bands, uh, with the sensitivity, we can remove foregrounds to that level. Um, of course, more models are required, not just one PySM. Uh, looking at smaller sky patches to see if we can improve the residuals here. Uh, all of that is in progress. Um, science objective number two is to um, rule out all models with a mass of um, a Planck scale in the potential or larger and high significance. Um, model of inflation differ in the reheating scenarios. So uh, the plan, uh, the, we should be able to measure sigma NS to 0.0015, the running to 0.002. This is about a factor of three both in both improvements for Planck. And this should give three sigma discrimination between models that have different reheating scenarios. Um, one more word about non-Gaussianity, uh, 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 how it relates to inflation. Single field models have nearly Gaussian fluctuations with FNL, a uh, measure of non-Gaussianity, smaller than one. Multi-field inflation, so this is FNL as a function of, uh, well, I'll describe that in a moment. Multi-field inflation should have FNL larger than one. So um, a detection of FNL larger than one is evidence for multi-field inflation. By correlating the Pico lensing, here I'm showing the Planck lensing, but I'll talk about the Pico lensing uh, map in a moment. By correlating the Pico lensing with LSST galaxies, um, we should be able to reach FNL equals one and two sigma. That's an important milestone. Uh, the assumptions for LSST galaxies are given here. Uh, the L min for, that is used for LSST, LSST galaxies, this is this L min here, is four, and that gives two sigma of FNL1. If we relax that to L min equals eight, starting here, if we can't use the LSST galaxies at such low Ls, uh, we could do FNL2 at three sigma, and the dash line is if we just start at uh, Pico at L equals 20. So that reduces to about two sigma. Growth of structure is affected by the sum of genome masses, as has been discussed here before. Um, the map of projected gravitational potential is a sensitive probe of the gro growth of structure. So, of course, I'm showing here the uh, projected lensing, the project projected potential from Planck, 2018. Um, the lensing amplitude is proportional to the neutrino mass. The matter density that we hope will come from BAO and the primordial perturbation power spectrum, which for the CMB is degenerate with tau. What I'm showing here is uh, the lensing potential CLL CL55 coming from Planck as a function of L. Um, 
So this is the tip. Right here is the tip of the CL55 power spectrum, and this is the Planck noise. This is the same, this is the noise level with the CL55 that we measured by Pico. So it's a signal to noise of about 560 after removal of foregrounds. It's about a little bit more than a factor of 10 improvement. Um, with that, and with the, sig with the tau measurement by Pico, which will have a full sky, we should be able to reach, so this is this plot, sigma tau, per, uh, clunk, Planck currently, at 0.07, uh, polarization noise. This is the baseline Pico reaching about 14 milli electron volts. Um, uh, and this is one of three independent probes that Pico will have. Science objective, science objective number four, identifying uh, new particles. Light species beyond the three neutrinos could have existed in the early universe and fallen out of equilibrium at some high temperature. The CMB spectra are sensitive to the number of light species and effective. Only three neutrinos gives an effective 3.046, and this is the current constraints from Planck, 95%. This is a plot of the decoupling temperature from going from a low temperature to high temperature. This is the QCD phase transition. This is the departure from the nominal N effective. So Planck at 0.36 is somewhere around here. Um, Pico should be able to do 0.06 at 95%. And uh, here is Planck, the Planck constraints on various types of particle as a function of the decoupling temperature. For a vector particle, for example, the improvement is about a factor of 400 in the decoupling, this is SO, Science, uh, Science uh, Observatory, uh, two sigma, and, and this is the QCD phase transition. Um, science objective number five, identify first luminous sources. This comes from the low, e low LEE probing uh, the optical depth of ionization. Okay, this is time remaining. Uh, Pico should be able to do sigma tau of 0.02. This is a cosmic variance limit. That determines the Z to realization. Delta Z is determined by uh, KSZ, not by Pico, from uh, S3 experiments. But these are constraints from Planck currently, uh, one sigma and two sigma of Planck plus S3. So this would be Simon's Observ Observatory or Bicep Keck. And here we show constraints with uh, stronger constraints on the zeronization coming from Pico, one sigma, two sigma. And these are different models of physical models of reionization. Uh, such models parallel lines for um, how efficient the sources are in producing photons and the mean free path. Those black lines occupy the plane, and here we're showing just one example of the constraints on, do, on these two parameters. Pico will constrain the uh, makeup of uh, dust. Is dust made mostly of carbon, uh, a separate population of carbon, or separate population of silicates, or are they combined together? Pico should have, so these are uh, current Planck constraints on the polarization fraction as a function of frequency. Different dust models, these are uh, carbon, these are silicates, these are the total for different models. And so with 21 bands, between here and six lower frequency bands that I can't fit in, and 3% per component per frequency band, we should be able to figure out exactly what is the makeup of galactic, uh, of galactic dust. This is also give better characterization uh, for B-mode science. We know that stars form at much lower rate than would be expected from gravitational collapse in our own galaxy. There are um, models that say the turbulence and magnetic fields slow the collapse from the diffuse ISM to molecular clouds into star-forming regions. But we don't know what is the ratio of energy stored in the magnetic field to that stored in turbulent motion over spatial scales from the diffuse ISM all the way in very large scales to molecular clouds to dense uh, cores which produce stars. We need measurements of magnetic fields over scales of galaxy down to dense cores. Showing here in yellow, 
is the Planck error at 0.7% on polarization uh, with five arc minute resolution. Shown in green is the Pico similar error with one arc minute. So we get that over the full sky with five times the resolution of Planck. Uh, this is the Orion. This is, shows the Planck measurements over the Orion uh, region in five arc minutes. Over this region alone, this shows the improvement in information content uh, with Pico. And of course, we will have that information over the entire galaxy. Um, in addition, we will map magnetic fields in 70 external galaxies with 100 measurements per galaxy. Only curr currently, we have only two are mapped. And for 10 nearby clouds with 0.1 parsecs, uh, we would map the scales at which stars are forming. These would be the first such measurements. Um, coming from these correlations, um, we would also get the sigma 8. Um, uh, through correlations between the lensing and, uh, and the LSST galaxies. Here I'm showing the error, the fractional error on sigma 8 as a function of the maximum uh, L on which the analysis is done. You can see that uh, right here at L is larger than about 200, we get sub percent accuracy on sigma 8 from this uh, cross correlation. Pico will detect, oops, sorry. Pico will detect 150,000 uh, clusters uh, with redshift. So this is n as a function of z. And once you get redshifts from optical and IR surveys, here we show again the similar sigma 8 constraints as a function of redshift, fractional error. And you can see that in this range, we get, again, fractional errors of less, less than a percent of, on sigma 8. And this will give dark energy parameters, constraint modified gravity, and determine neutrino mass. This is one of the second constraints. Um, the th TSZ, the Compton Y map, uh, will be mapped with very high precision. Here, you show the, uh, here we show the uh, Planck data points in blue. In green are L by L measurements, no binning, done with PICO. Uh, this will be the signal to noise with cross correlation with LSST is 3000. And uh, this will give a breakdown uh, in correlation to tomographic redshift bins to track the evolution of electrode pressure and constrain the role of energetic feedback in structure formation. Um, here are some of the legacy surveys. 4,500 strong, strongly uh, lensed galaxies up to z equal 5. Uh, this will give early galaxy formation. Here we show uh, the, uh, the um, confusion the sig sorry, the, the uh, flux limit versus frequency. This, uh, the red line is where the ground can make measurements. Uh, this is Pico uh, from the black all the way to here. You can see that this matches the peak of the lens. So these are two galaxies at z equals 5.2 and z equals 2.3. There have been, these are actual detections, not by Pico, of course, actual uh, detections of lens galaxies. You can see that they're boosted. And these will be detected with a uh, high signal by Pico. 4,500 of them currently, there are 13 known. 50,000 protoclusters up to z equal 4.5. Currently, only a few tens are known. 30,000 galaxies at low, uh, at low redshift to give uh, the dust SCD as a function of galaxy property. 2,000 polarized radio sources and uh, polarization of a few thousand dust galaxies. <laughs> Uh, to get the ordering of magnetic fields uh, in those galaxies. Uh, open discovery space, is Lambda CDM correct? So Jacques has already talked about, we have a uh, good fit with six parameters, uh, not we very well understood universe. Um, and we have the outstanding puzzles with H0 and uh, low L anomalies, perhaps sigma A tension, perhaps not, not clear. So this shows the improvement that Pico will give on uh, a Fisher calculations. So of course, the figure of merit is proportional to one over the error bar, the volume of the error bar in parameter space. So relative to Planck, Planck is one, relative to Planck, the baseline is about 10 billion error, the error volume will shrink by about 10 billion. Uh, and it could go up to 30 billion depending on uh, what we think we actually do. 
This is with our constraint. If you keep uh, R equals zero, then this is about 50 million. Uh, also, discovery space, uh, primordial magnetic fields. Uh, were there primordial magnetic fields? Uh, there was a talk here yesterday. Uh, some young galaxies show magnetic fields that are too strong to be explained by simple dynamo. Uh, we will give uh, 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 a constraint of 0.1 nanogauss uh, in one sigma. This will rule out purely primordial origin of the largest magnetic field observed. And uh, we will constrain cosmic birefringence. Uh, here are two slides on the um, implementation. It's a simple, straightforward implementation, two reflectors and a focal plane, providing a large usable field of view with uh, three color antenna coupled uh, transition head sensors. Uh, the spacecraft spins around this. This is a stationary um, uh, bus and the spacecraft spins. We don't need to have three color antenna. Uh, we can do two colors or we can do one color with slightly less sensitivity. Um, ambient temperature primary, uh, cooled, uh, secondary, and 100 millikelvin focal plane. Uh, the peak implementation is at L2, has been described similar to core. I won't dwell on that. 50% of the sky in about two weeks, full sky in six months. 10-year uh, mission, so you have 10 independent maps. Um, and uh, all the 13,000 detections will, ma will make independent TQ and U maps. This shows the dipole signal. All the time larger than about 4 millikelvin, given a large, uh, large calibration at all times. The red curves is Planck. Uh, I have another slide, one more slide on foreground removal. I won't dwell on it. You're encouraged to ask questions. PICO is the only instrument with the combination of sky coverage, resolution, frequency band, and sensitivity to achieve all of the science with one platform. Only a space platform can provide the level of control of systematic uncertainty that PICO will have. As I said, we'll have 13,000 detectors making 10 redundant maps of IQU over the entire sky making multiple uh, cross-checks. Uh, we have some evidence that PICO has the combination of frequency bands and sensitivity to account for galactic foregrounds. There's no doubt that more verification of that capability is needed. The implementation relies on current technologies, straightforward extension, and uh, this is what we will recommend to the decal panel. PICO is the obvious extension to the progress we have already made in the last decade to be implemented in the next decade. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, some questions? Maybe Jack first. Okay, that was easy. Okay. So, um, uh, as I described earlier, uh, we have we are basing, or we would like to base our predictions based on actual simulation, end-to-end -end simulations, and and exercises of foreground separation. And so, as I said, uh, this is one of those exercises that we have done with uh, one of the PSM models. There are other models that are being analyzed. What I'm showing here is, um, so this is the particular Pi SM model that was used for this, if you want to figure out exactly what, what kind of synchrotron has been used and so on. This has been done on 50% of the sky. What I'm showing here um, is work by, by the way, this is all work by Matura Mazze, has done great, uh, great work. Uh, what I'm showing here are uh, constraints to check um, whether we need the 21 to 800 gigahertz or whether we could use a narrower frequency range. And so Mathieu had run the analysis. This particular model had an R of 10 to the minus, uh, 1 10 to the minus 3 put in, and the lensing. And so shown here is the model and, and the lensing, and the black is the, is the input. And with 21 to 800 gigahertz, we recover the CMB very well. Um, when we remove the lowest frequency bands, two lowest frequency bands, and remove the two highest frequency bands, Mathieu reruns this analysis uh, with, um, uh, with the commander algorithm. This is not GNILK, this is commander. Uh, what we find is that uh, there's uh, obvious excess at the low ends. This is an indication, it's not a conclusive, but it is an indication that we need the broad frequency coverage to clean foregrounds. 
had done uh, other tests not as clear as those ones, and it seems that the effect is primarily uh, from the high frequency bands. Thanks. So you have shown uh, goals, and I think what you called it discovery space. So the goals, which are, I think there were five of them. Seven. Seven, okay. These are the ones that are the requirement for the mission? Correct. Or seven the other ones are like ancillary signs that you get for... Correct. The, the seven are the requirements, and they have led to the specific design that I showed in the first slide. And the extra is all the extra you get. Yes. More questions? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yes, the study began with, and what we told NASA we will do, so, so uh, Francois was asking, did we consider a spectrometer? The study began with, do we want to do a spectrometer? Do we want to do an imager? Or do we want to do a combination? We looked at the uh, spectrometer science. We looked at the uh, imager science. A combination does not fit in the cost window. To do justice to two missions, to the two science goals, um, a combination would not fit in the $1 billion. So if we try to fit uh, two instruments in the $1 billion, it weakens both. Between the spectrometer and the imager, we decided to concentrate on the imager. OK, maybe one more question, because I think we should really go for lunch. All right. <clears throat> I, I think I heard the first question. Yeah, so, so let me repeat the first one which I heard. How confident we are about the delensing level? The 85%, the yeah, I'll answer that. And what was the second one? Second one is that even if we can do this, what will be the non Gaussian nature of foreground which can bias the delensing estimator? Right. Right, very good, very good. So uh, there are two values that I should quote about delensing. Um, delensing is um, anyone between 73% to 85%. The 73% is including foreground removal. So when we include foreground removal in the delensing process, we expect 73%. 85% is without including. So you, you should keep in mind those two. Okay, I think we should go for lunch. Let's uh, thank Shoal and all, all the speakers, of course, again. And, and then we should be back at 2.